welcome to this week's program. We're going to be looking at animal health and we're also going to be looking at wool, but in just a moment, it's horticulture. Jim, what sort of spring are we having, it's, apart from it's being late? Well, it, it, growers are saying it's being late. I, I just wonder, um, looking around some crops just recently, uh, maybe it's more on time of old. That's, that's what I'm thinking. But um, you look, it's so what you're saying is all the other ones we've been having recently are early. Well, well, last year it was, it was, you know, it was early, and then it was warm through this period, and then it got cold through the summer. We end up with a late actual harvest. But this year, I think we're going to have a bang, bang, bang. Uh, and let's hope we don't have any, um, um, you know, spring frosts or too many of them coming coming through this next sort of six weeks. Um, a lot of snow in the mountains and um, a full El Nino year. There's no doubt in my mind about that now. Um, westerly conditions coming over, raining on the west coast, dry on the east coast, and it clears up at night at three o'clock, four o'clock in the afternoon, and down comes the cold temperatures. So that's going to be the, our life for the next three or four weeks. So hopefully uh, we'll get through that, Rob. North Island, how are they looking? North Island's pretty blooming dry um, on the very east coast, but gosh, through the central North Island, they, they've had a lot of rain lately, a lot of rain. And uh, I actually was through there uh, recently, and uh, good grass c coverage. Um, and, and looking quite a picture, but uh, very much under, uh, wet underfoot. So, uh, but they've got supplementary feed going there, and of course uh, they've had some dry times further north, and uh, the east coast looks to be heading to what we're going to be into down here in the South Island, a pretty dry summer. A few weeks ago you told us to wait as far as herbicides are concerned. Are we looking about timing now? We are. We're perfect for timing now. All the residual herbicides, if they're going to go on, the, the real tough ones, that they will be on by now. But now the knockdowns come in and there's, there's, because of the slowness of the season, there is only a little bit of weed out there because the guys have managed to keep their what we call understory, under apples and under grapes and, and those sort of crops, quite clean. However, the tem soil temperatures are rising reasonably rapidly now, so things are going to move quite quickly. Uh, suggest that the glyphosates and the ammonium glucosinates and those sort of knockdown materials are the ones to go for. And what about copper? Is it too late for that? No, no, just coming up for it really, Rob, um, in, in conjunction with sulphur with some crops, sulphur and copper, but copper may need to take that uh, bacterial out of the out of the plant tissue to minimise frost, for frost protection, to minimise the bacteria. The bacteria freezes before uh, water does, so uh, it brings the temperature within the tissue of the leaf uh, down quite quickly. If we can remove that by uh, applying a bacteria stat, such as copper, um, that helps quite considerably. Got to have a look at the conditions going forward and say, look, Thursday, Friday could be a, a real frosty morning, uh, potentially so. Let's put our copper on today. And it get, takes about 72 hours to really maximise the removal of the bacteria. And the other thing, I guess, is to make sure that the grass between rows is, is trimmed. It's trimmed right down short, um, or cultivated. And sometimes growers actually cultivate it. Another thing that we're suggesting to growers is that they put, a, say, a glyphosate, just a light rate, two litres a hectare, down the rows. It blows out the weeds there for that period of time for about a month, and then, uh, then the, sorry, the grasses and whatever, and then they come away again. They actually do survive that. So that's another way of protecting. It's, it's made it, get that, get that trash, the trash pulls down the cold temperatures. If you can remove that or eliminate that trash, the cold temperatures aren't as great. So even if you just put a mulcher through? Even if you put a mulcher through, ideal. Ideal. In fact, it opens it up and allows moisture to go in the ground, not necessarily go out of the ground. <laughs> now, that's a bit Irish, but it's true. <laughs> I don't know what you're meaning. Now, the other thing is sort of more broad acre, things like like the, the crops, onions and such. Yeah, well, the, the, the crop, the onions are going in now. Uh, potatoes are just starting to go in. Ground preparation is I mean, it's fantastic, really. Uh, the guys, the carrot guys, the potato guys have just finished picking their crops probably in the last month or so and they, they've had a wonderful season. Um, unfortunately, the European prices aren't, aren't smart so their prices have been back a little bit. But in all intents and purposes, we're actually going into the spring from a horticultural perspective in very good condition because nine and a half out of ten crops are covered by uh, monitored irrigation. So uh, there's not the problem of being affected by drought. You can add water to a crop, but you, you certainly can't if you haven't got it, one, or if you have too much of it, it that, that's when you don't need it. So we can manage our crops a lot better in a dry year. They end up being quality and colour comes through too. Yeah, what do you do if it gets all soggy because you have a very, very wet season? 
Yeah, well, there's not a heap lot you can do, to be honest. Um, if the ground's tight and you know it's tight, you should have applied gypsum or something like that to open it up a little bit and allow a bit of that drainage to happen and the nutrients to come free. But if it's blocked up and logged up, it's, the plants do not um, cope with that. They usually have what we call dozy crops, especially likes of grapes or apples or, or mm. any sort of tree fruit. Um, so it, it, there's not a lot you can do about it. Um, however, most of the horticultural crops are, you know, horses for courses, so they're on land that is reasonably free draining. Um, except when you get to the Mutri Hills and Nelson around there with there's clays underneath, those guys know how to manage with gypsum and also side, uh, side cutting of the, of the roots and letting, letting uh, the gypsum and, and lime go into those cracks and get into the root system and actually free things up a bit. Because I know that if you have a pot plant, it doesn't like wet feet and you, and you leave it sitting in water. Yeah, well, it did not like it. No, I mean, you can imagine like us sitting in a, in a, a pot full of water all day. It's not very comfortable. Make your feet go frickly, wouldn't it? It would, really. Yes, it would. <laughs> so it's the same sort of principle because the temperature stays cool and you, they don't do their normal growing and they don't transpire the water. They've got too much water in them to transpire it all off. So therefore, the photosynthesis doesn't work in a plant. It's, it's pretty basic, simple stuff. But one of the other things, Rob, is that, uh, that there are some nit nitrogen uh, fertilisers going on at the moment. I, what I urge is the growers check the, the nitrate leaching, where they are in terms of their numbers per year. Uh, most horticultural crops are around about the 10 uh, kilograms per year, and, and that's quite manageable, and you'll get a good growth uh, applied correctly. So don't over don't over do the, do the nitrogen at this time of the year. Uh, you're, you're, you're not doing the land any good, and you're not doing your pocket any good either paperwork, accountability and traceability. More and more important, I was just at a situation last week where we were going through some of the processes and we need to step up. Uh, the international markets are really calling for, I mean, look, they are forms of trade barriers. Anything that they can put in front of us to make it difficult to get our produce to where we have to get it. And traceability is becoming number one. There's no doubt in my mind about it. And that's traceability, not just for chemical application, that's for every input a farmer does and how he takes it from A to B, what sort of trucks it in, all this sort of thing. So it's tracing and tracking. Tracing is for those inputs you put into the crop mm. and tracking is for moving that potato from A to B. I didn't think we were big enough in the world market for people to worry about us. Well, they, we, we worry about it because we are, we, so, we are so reliant on our exports. You know, 90% of what we produce in New Zealand can't be consumed because we haven't got the population. Uh, so we need to take out our produce to the other side of the world or up into Asia or whatever, and they are becoming a little more fussy. And, and the good thing about it to date, touch wood, and may we continue this process, uh, they look upon New Zealand as being clean and green, as much as I don't like using that cliche, um, be, because we have got, at this point, good trace, track, track and traceability, and we need to keep that up. We need to continue to be leaders in that area. So it's mainly driven by the consumer rather than by oh, the governments? Without a doubt. It's, oh, well, governments will, will put laws in front of you to make sure you, you to go through the steps. No, no, consumers are, are demanding it, and more so today than ever before. Europe, what's happening there briefly? Because that's been a bit of a problem with oversupply. Well, it is, but I mean, they're getting oversupply of people now, so hopefully those people will, will one day get something <laughs> to eat. They don't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully they get something to eat, but no, it's pretty serious still, uh, Rob. The, um, the, the, the blockade into Russia is still quite uh, positively affecting, negatively affecting the, the marketplace. Uh, milk's awash, uh, fresh and vegetables, and, and uh, um, well, interesting enough, I'll change that a little bit. Fruit and vegetables on the sort of East, east of Germany is, uh, sorry, west of Germany is in pretty good shape, but west, uh, east of Germany, getting towards Poland, getting towards Russia, they've had a heck of a dry summer, and actually some of their production is quite low. So there's a little bit of reprieve there. There is just a wee <coughs> A little bit of reprieve, so maybe there's, a, maybe there's a tunnel and maybe we'll find the light one day. Here's hoping, Jim, thank you very much indeed. In just a moment, we'll be talking about racing at Frickerton. Tim, we're counting down to Cup Week already. Yeah, uh, goodness, less than seven, uh, less than eight weeks from uh, New Zealand Cup and Show Week, and uh, yeah, I was doing the count before. It was eight weeks on Saturday morning, so uh, we're a little under eight weeks now, and yeah, one uh, massive week that the rest of the country likes to imitate, uh, like wishes they could have, and tried imitating and can't do it. We've got it. There must be a lot of preparation as far as the horses are concerned. Well, yeah, it's um, basically the, race being, the races are open to horses from the length and breadth of the country. We've um, even got a bit of interest from Australia uh, this year that we're hoping will uh, come to fruition with uh, 
with a horse competing in the uh, in the Christchurch Casino New Zealand Cup from Henry Henry Oliver's uh, Melbourne stable, Caulfield stable. Um, essentially, uh, we take entries for most races only about a week out. Uh, but our four big races, being the Sorties New Zealand 2000 Guineas, the New Zealand Bloodstock 1000 Guineas, the Copeland's Bakeries Mile and the Christchurch Casino New Zealand Cup, they all closed in the first week in September and horses then uh, have to perform in the eight weeks leading up to those big races to get their rating points up and uh, when the field is decided it uh, works from the highest rated horse down to the, uh, the starting limit, which is 18 here at Rickerton Park during Cup Week. Uh, and so you want to actually be in that top uh, 18 based on your rating points because the line just gets drawn under number 18 and they're the ones that start. Jeez, that's a lot of pressure. Well, it puts a lot of pressure on the trainers and uh, and owners to get their horses competing in the right races to perform well uh, that, so that the handicapper takes notice of them and says, gee, that horse performed well. It won uh, uh, in such a manner that I'll give it X rating points and uh, then that you know gets the, uh, gets the figure up so that they make that top mark. So... 18 in the final field, how many entries would you be getting? Uh, for the two big guineas races, we've got an excess of 100 and round figures 120. Uh, the cup, we've got uh, round figures 70 and the Copeland's Bakery's mile uh, again 50. So uh, there is quite, uh, there's quite a competitive process to getting a start. There's also a sense of realism perhaps from the, uh, the two open races from owners and trainers. They probably being older horses, they already know where they are in terms of, of ability, um, whereas the two guineas races, there's a lot of horses that either haven't been to the races or have only had one or two starts and people are banking on the horse having the potential to perform in the next eight weeks. Uh, perhaps those races there's a lot of dream as well, you know, which is what keeps the game going. There's some of the proven two-year-olds from last year and the unproven three-year-olds uh, at the moment looking for that group one glory. Um, but as I say, the two uh, open races, probably a lot more disclosed form in them. So I guess there must be a lot of racing to be able to qualify between now and Cup Week. Oh, absolutely. Length and breadth of the country. Um, for instance, uh, the horses winning at Ruakaka on the weekend uh, that are targeting Cup Week. Um, and there's horses from Southland uh, that were uh, racing at Ashburton and Gore. Um, the Dennis Brothers won with a horse called the Bishop, which they're setting for the, for the Cup. Uh, that was at Gore last Thursday. Um, and we race regularly from um, early September, two meetings in September, two in October. Uh, and then we hit uh, our New Zealand Cup meeting. And uh, yeah, there's racing the length and breadth of the country that people will be using as means of heading to Rickerton. Tim, is there a home track advantage? Um, it's an interesting thing. I think uh, punters can determine in their own mind whether there's a home track advantage. Uh, some horses perform better on their home track, probably because they're comfortable and they do their training there every day. It doesn't stop others, say Kevin Myers is a classic example, who travels horses to most of our Rickerton meetings from his Wanganui base and they perform exceptionally well. So, uh, yeah, there can be, but um, it's probably more how each horse um, sees its, itself and how comfortable it is in its environment. Now, you're already getting some of the out-of-towners arriving. Yeah, well and truly, Tiakau Stables are here already. Uh, they raced here on the 5th of September. Uh, they won a race with uh, Princess Devone. Uh, they won a race uh, with Risque at Ashburton on Friday. Uh, they started with three horses uh, two weeks ago. They're up to seven and they'll probably have ten by the time we get to Cup and Show Week. They're based in Matamata. Uh, training par partnership of Stephen Ortridge and Jamie Richards. And uh, yeah, as you say, they're already here. Tim, do you ever have a flutter? Because you seem to have a fair bit of inside knowledge. Well, I love a bet, but I still work for a living, so that inside <laughs> knowledge doesn't always transfer into a guaranteed collect. <laughs> still to come on the programme, we're going to be talking wool and animal health. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted southern oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. 
the way the world is growing. Working with nature, good for the plant, good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Calf rearing, it's that time of the year, but it's hugely important. Very important and a lot of animal health issues that can um, creep in and cause disaster, disastrous results if things aren't done properly. Uh, so there's a, there's a number of simple things that should be borne in mind that, that, that can go a, a hell of a long way in preventing these, these problems creeping up, Rob. Um, Minimising the source of where you're obtaining your calves is, cannot be overestimated. When we start pulling in uh, little bit groups of calves from here and there and everywhere else, of course, effectively, we can be pulling in all the infectious problems mm. from different populations and putting them together. And we all know um, throughout history, in fact, what happens when we bring in a, an infectious disease to a population that has had no inherent immunity to it. I mean, so foot rot and sheep. Absolutely, influenza and the Aztecs or whatever, whatever population we're talking about. And so by trying to ensure that we're minimising the number of sources of our our, our stock that we're getting, we, we're minimising also the potential for these outbreaks to occur. So if you've got a, a, a good reliable source of calves and it's, it's stood you in good stead in the past then it's really good to keep these relationships going. Um, the, the initial management of the calves, um, which I guess goes hand in hand for ensuring a really good uh, source of calves, is also important. Um, as most people involved in livestock breeding uh, are probably well aware, uh, the importance of that first colostral intake is so, so <coughs> important when it comes <coughs> to inferring immunity. And so for anyone who needs a little refresher, the colostrum is that, that first milk produced by the dam in the first two or three days, and it's only really effectively absorbed probably for 18 hours or so post-birth. And so it's very important that these youngsters get a, at least either a good suck or there's a good source of colostrum that can be um, given to them by, by tube feeding or by, by, uh, by feeding um, artificially through a teat um, so we can ensure good colostral immunity before, before that, that sort of time period of 12 to 18 hours is up. And uh, so again, I guess it, it infers good management of the of the newborn stock as as a good inference of uh, of a good source of of young stock at, in the first place. Do you keep little groups together and not mix them? The biggest, the most important aspect of grouping animals together um, is pr apart from source of animals is is age group. There are a number of infectious diseases that tend to target. Or, or affect animals of different age group. And so if we're keeping an age group um, together through the rearing process and we stop mixing and matching, and it's very tempting in fact that when we get um, a disparity in size to hold animals back and shift them from group to group to try and get even yeah, even <clears throat> spread of animals. And as far as controlling or preventing infectious disease, that can be a disaster because um, we're getting older animals that may have an immunity to uh, a, a disease that might have been endemic in an earlier age group, they might still be shedding that organism. You hold them back, put them into the younger group, and then we've got a real good recipe for an outbreak of disease again. Oh. Yeah, so <coughs> keeping, keeping those age groups together. And on top of that, Rob, I guess, making sure that we've got manageable groups of animals. I always like to say, let's try not to get more than 20 animals together in one group. And the reason for that's quite simple. If we do start getting an outbreak, at least we've got a chance of containing it to that one group of, of, of animals, that, that those 
those 20 or 10 or whatever, if we start getting massive groups of animals, our losses can be much more exaggerated if we get a big group. And it's much harder to contain larger groups of, of animals when we've got infectious disease. So being able to have a, a relatively manageable, relatively small group um, without going over the top and being able to contain any disease outbreaks like that is really, really important. Now, underneath, or under, underlying what you've been saying is hygiene. Hygiene, exceptionally important. Um, as far <coughs> as, uh, and, and also I guess uh, important is the whole husbandry and housing scenario. And so um, often, as you many have seen, when we've got decent sized calf rearing operations, we have little pens side by side. And if we can, um, try and minimise the potential for nose-to-nose -nose contact between those groups, we are minimising the risk of um, infectious disease spreading through nasal secretions and bodily secretions. And so either solid barriers, or sometimes what I really like, because it promotes airflow, is actually just a little bit of dead space between two groups. So maybe a double fence set up, so there's a little space which prevents this sort of direct contact between groups really really good but on top of that as I've just mentioned we want to promote good ventilation good airflow uh, as well as there being good levels of shelter to prevent respiratory diseases and, and ammonia levels rising and things like that. That leads straight on to flooring because some people use rocks, some people use sawdust, some people use straw. Yeah, There's any number of, of options <coughs> there Rob. I guess the important thing is that we want to try and minimise this sort of fetid, uh, contaminated, heavily contaminated uh, zone on the floor that's going to uh, kind of be a source of infectious disease. And there are a number of diseases, and what comes to mind straight away is coccidiosis. The little organism requires moisture, humidity for it to sporulate to form the infectious component of, of the organism and so this moist, damp, um, infected sort of areas under floor are really prone for this, this sort of thing to, to get away from us. So it's a balance between not wanting to overcommit to labour to cleaning the damp floor out all the time um, but having really good drainage and a, and a lower level that's going to hold any moisture there and, and have, a, have a nice dry free draining surface on the top. Um, that's not going to be damaging to the feet. So there are a number of components to think about and um, often there's many tried and, true, tr tried and true methods that have been proven to be beneficial season to season. But if you're starting to get infectious problems creeping up and having a couple of bad years, then these are all factors that could be thought about and actually, as I always suggest, it's, it's really, really good to sit down with a professional such as your veterinarian who's in a good position to understand the epidemiology, all the factors involved in these infectious diseases and be able to piece all these risk factors together and come up with a good plan for husbandry and preventative strategies that's tailor made for your situation in particular. And a can of Jay's fluid doesn't go amiss. Absolutely. Well, hygiene and <coughs> disinfection is very important, and there's a number of options available. When to do that, whether it's at the end of the calf rearing season or whether your system is robust enough to actually minimise that input until the end of the, the rearing season, that's, that's something that also can be discussed. Nick, thank you very much indeed. In just a moment, we'll be talking to a lady who's very hands-on with calf rearing. Tell me about the operation, how many cows have you got? We've got 1,200 cows. We share milk for dairy holdings. So they don't have any names? <laughs> no, no, they've only got numbers. Uh, the, the odd one has um, got its own personality and that people get attached to it, but no names, no. <laughs> Carol, you're, in, you're the officer in charge of the calving and calves? Calves, yep, I'm in charge of calves, yep. What's the regime? Um, well, they first come into the shed, they get put into a pen, they get um, sprayed with iodine as soon as they come into the shed, and they get gold colostrum, which is the best colostrum out of a cow, the very first milking, which is we call, I assume everyone calls it the gold stuff, and they get at least two litres of that as soon as they come into the shed, and then we come back in the afternoon like I am now, and they get a, another feed of that, so that we try to give them those two feeds of that really good colostrum. Get, in, get, get that into their stomach as soon as we can. 
Now you said iodine, is that to, 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 to dry seal off the... Yeah. yeah, and stop any infection getting into the navel because they can get navel ill in their joints and then they're really hard to save once that, that gets bad into their joints, yeah. And obviously if you've got 12,000 cows, you've got, or 1,200 cows I should say. 12,000, that'd be a lot. <laughs> but you've got, you've got 1,200 calves. To feed, yeah, we don't keep every all of them though. We keep about 25% of them as heifers, I think, roughly. Usually between 250 and 350-ish calves. The rest either, we keep some bulls, Jersey bulls and Herefords, and the rest are go on Bobby's, Bobby, on the Bobby truck, about four days old. The bull calves, they're for breeding? For our own use, yet yeah, for um, go over our heifers, the Jerseys, and the Herefords um, go over our cows after mating, after AB. So, these calves, how long are they in the shed for? Um, well this year I'm hoping to do a few less and hopefully they will stay in the sheds. Um, they really stay here until it just gets too wet and then they have to go out in the paddocks. Um, I think they'll do better in here than going out, out and none of our fencing is very good for calves. <laughs> it's only two wires and that's hopeless. <laughs> so I'm hoping to keep them in here for at least maybe six, eight weeks before they go out. So room and development? Uh, this year they're only getting straw, just um, cost-wise, they were not buying any meal, so we, they, they get um, straw and they get bentonite or true bond, which just helps bond them up and helps, their, helps them from getting runny poos or the shits, as we say. <laughs> it, uh, without being disrespectful, things are tight for you guys things are, yeah, every, yeah, in the whole industry. Everything we spend, yep. yep. So how much time does it take? How long are you coming down to the shed twice a day for? Um, I start, I leave home because we don't actually live on farm anymore, um, so I leave home at quarter past eight, usually get home at quarter past eleven, then I come back at one until about half past one, so I've been doing this a long time so I've got it pretty streamlined. <laughs> and of course price of milk powder and that sort of thing, because that's mixed I assume. Yeah, we, we know we use the milk. We use the milk here, um, the colostrum milk. The first four days can't go in the vat, so we use all that for the calf rearing. And, and then, then it goes on to what, for once they've done the colostrum bit. And then it goes in the vat and gets taken away by Fonterra. But yeah, the first four days it gets um, fed to the calves. So you have, so they have milk for more than four days though? Yes, for about ten weeks they'll get milk. It's yeah. a long haul. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right through to the end of October, I suppose it is, or yeah, early November, the last ones will be weaned. Now you're in the mid Canterbury area. Pretty dry land and very light. Um, yeah, it is here. Very stony on this particular property. Yeah, um, we've got two irrigators though, two big pivots, and um, rotor rainers down that other side there. And we've got a big pond over there that um, that feeds them. Feeds them all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was the word I was looking for. Is it everything good though. I mean, you, you're yeah. being very cheerful. Everybody is expecting dairy farmers and sheer milkers to have yeah. very long faces. If you've been in, we've, I've been dairy farming all my life. My father's been in it since the 1930s and, you know, goes like this all the time. So hopefully we're on a bottom and it's going to go up again. It has done for the last 30 years or more. So it's not the first time it's been down. You're hanging in there. Yeah, you know, you've got a choice. You can't, you can't just sell them and, <laughs> you just, and you get attached to them anyway. An amazing thing how they do manage to get those calves to look so good. After the break, we're going to be talking wool. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website, ontheland.co.nz. Be Active begins here. 
in the cold, clean, unpolluted southern oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things. Make a positive change to the planet. To feed the world. To protect the future. To live well. To be the generation that will make a change. Join us. How's the wool season going? It's a pretty good season so far uh, compared to last season. Uh, we have seen some significant price increases locally. We've seen the New Zealand dollar weaken significantly uh, against the basket of currencies that we trade against. Uh, there's four main currencies, which is uh, US dollar, Euro, Sterling and Australian dollar. Um, the market indicators for the different types of wool have seen some quite big increases. Uh, a lot of that is currency related. The merino wool this year is about 15% uh, above where it was this time last year. The mid micron has been the star of the season. That's nearly 40% on average above where it was the previous season. So some mm. significant gains. Mr. McKinsey. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they have something to answer there, telling people that in that sector that they should go and grow potatoes. Uh, for those that have stayed in the uh, mid-micron sector, they're doing substantially better than they've mm. done for a long, long time. The fine crossbred sector, which is mainly the Chinese market, um, that is around about 20% above where it was last year, and even the coarse crossbred is 15% on average above where it was last year. Now that's against the basket of currencies that we have. When you look at the specifics, like say the New Zealand dollar against the US dollar, we are 30% weaker against the US dollar for the same period last year. Now you might ask, well if we're 30% weaker, why isn't the New Zealand price, say for crossbred sector, 30% stronger? Mm. Which is the normal equation <coughs> that happens. Yep. Part of that is that um, as we know, all commodities in the world are struggling a little bit. China's uh, a bit on the slowdown, and they are the major manufacturing powerhouse for a lot of the rest of the world. So you have this sort of slowdown in commodities and a uh, very hand-to-mouth way of operating at the moment. So we have the scenario that the farmers in New Zealand are getting effectively half the gain that should be there on the currency, and our clients are taking the other half of the gain now you think that's not quite fair, we should get all of it here. But what it is doing is actually stabilising our market and keeping New Zealand wool prices above our competing markets, etc. cetera. So uh, it's, it's sort of not super good news, but it's better news than it could be. Mm. I mean, we, <clears throat> we are by reputation the best wool growers in the world, aren't we? Yes, and I think that's been reflected in our market prices at the moment. There is that recognition. Because the pipeline is quite empty, anybody who is buying wool wants to be able to buy it today, ship it tomorrow, and process it through their system to get it into the marketplace straight away. So if you are buying wool that is a little bit hard to process, may have some processing issues, could hold up your production, then that is a worry for you. So they are tending <coughs> to target the better wools so they can move them through very quickly and take advantage of the market at the moment. Case in point is um, short, mid, uh, fine crossbred wolves between, say, 30 micron and 33 microns of between 1 to 3 to 2 to 4 inch. It is just running hot at the moment, and it is for a specialist product in China called face-to-face uh, -face processing, where they make a yarn and they make it uh, two sides together and then cut the material down through the middle. This is hot in the fashion market at the moment, so They'll buy it off us today, and the next day they'll open up their letter of credit and say, could you scour it last week instead of next week, please, and get it on a vessel? <laughs> oh, yeah. No problem at <laughs> no all. Problem no problem at all, yeah. <laughs> so you have segments in the market that are super hot, but 
because of this whole scenario with the commodity market and uh, people aren't too sure which way things are going to jump in the long term, this is what is putting the pressure on these segments and they want it straight away so that they can capture the market advantage. God, how long have you and I and John Dawson been saying, let's make wool fashionable again? Yes, um, but it's a fickle business, unfortunately. Um, what we are seeing, of course, is that there is a bit of a trend back to natural products, particularly out of uh, Northern Europe. There's quite a demand about knowing where it came from, how it's processed. We're now facing things in our industry where we have to give assurances around animal health, uh, how they looked after. Really? You, you guys are hitting the traceability and accountability and transporting Very much so. again. And it's not as if it's from um, the authorities in each country, it is from individual companies or um, um, retail chains such as uh, IKEA, which is one of the largest retail chains in the world. Another one out of Japan is called Muji. They're very much um, requiring information around how the animal's treated, uh, how they're shorn, what is their animal health. They also want to know around the ethics of what we're doing. Um, we even have to answer questions around child labour, uh, which you know we <laughs> well, find in our country that quite unusual. That would have been pretty tough when I was being brought up on a farm. <laughs> <laughs> That's unpaid child labour. That's different. absolutely. It was, yeah, I mean it was. Yeah, well, I mean I was knee high to a perch. You put it when I started in the shearing shed. But anyway, all joking aside. But yeah, paid as in non-family. Exactly. And there are mm. countries where it has been a major issue. India has been one in particular. A lot of Asian countries, of course. So because our product goes to a lot of those countries for um, first stage processing, either into a yarn or a fabric or even a finished article, and then retailed into Western Europe or Japan or America, the consumers in those countries are asking questions about what has happened in the life cycle of this um, product and has it been handled ethically. So we have to set up systems and reporting now around where does it come from, what happened to it through the pathway. Unbelievable. So it's a different world. H how do you do that? Because, I mean, you... It's a lot of it is through closer relationship with farmers and farmer groups. Uh, there are farmer <coughs> declarations around what they do, what pesticides they use. We have to prove the systems and the track and trace that we have, that uh, every lot is recorded, every kilo is tracked. Uh, the IWTO, International Wool Textile Organisation, which governs how we trade internationally, not just for New Zealand, but for all the wool exporting countries in the world, of which New Zealand is a member country, uh, are now all collaboratively working together to come up with a animal welfare standard that um, the wool exporting and producing countries can aim to, to use as a mechanism for when we are queried about how your animals housed and looked after. God, unbelievable. Malcolm, what was that, that thing that we launched at the Untouched World that the shearers were working with and written in conjunction with you guys? And the yes, and that is becoming part of the documentation because we have lots of segments within the industry. You have the Shearers Association, you have the Council of Wool Exporters, the National Council of Wool Interests, you have the Brokers Association. So all these groups are working together to build the building blocks that will make the standard that uh, we all work to in the industry and internationally. And it's about differentiating our um, processes and product and keeping our wool at the forefront of our clients' minds as being a sustainable product. Welcome, thank you very much indeed. We're going to be staying on the subject of sheep next when we talk to Tony Bywater from Lincoln University. Tony, what's the Lincoln University doing as far as sheep research is concerned? Well, we've, we've um, got the Lincoln Sheep Program uh, established now. Last year was the establishment year. We're pretty much up and running. There's still a few loose ends that have got to be tied together. Uh, but we've got two or three trials um, planned for this year. Uh, the main one is probably a parasite management comparison on our summer safe unit. Uh, we've also got a repeat of the double lambing um, pilot trial that we did last year uh, and we'll be doing some um, work with uh, um, urea use and um, parasite management on finishing uh, units as well. So those are the three main um, uh, 
the trials main, that are there. The main focus is the main. Well, the main focus still remains the resilience and and uh, consistency of production, productivity and resilience on sheep farms. So that's the main focus. Can you expand on the the parasite trials? Okay, um, the parasite trial base is based on uh, the notion that the main source of um, larval. Uh, infection in pastures is the breakdown in immunity uh, in the periparturian ewe, which is the ewe around lambing. Um, she loses her immunity to the parasites because of the high demands for energy and protein for lactation, uh, gestation and lactation. Um, and because she loses that uh, immunity, you get a massive increase in the, in the viable eggs shed through the feces. That contaminates the pasture and that um, is the source of infection for lambs. So we figure that if you can replace or uh, increase the, particularly the protein uh, availability to the ewe, you might be able to um, overcome that loss of immunity. Um, and if we can do that, then the ewe remains immune to the, to the worms, they don't shed viable eggs, uh, we get rid of that massive increase in, in um, contamination of the pasture. The lambs will then not get con uh, infected to the same extent and hopefully that means we use far less drench which of course uh, means much slower build up of drench resistance in the worms and that's the real, that's the long term real benefit of this is that it slows down drench resistance. The, uh, the mating old cold use for a second time in a season? Yeah, um, we tried this last year, a uh, bit of a pilot trial, two dose rates for uh, gonadotrophin to uh, bring the ewes into season in uh, October, November, before they wean their, their uh, August lambs. Um, the low dose treatment didn't do an awful lot. <laughs> Uh, the high dose treatment, we got 55% uh, lambing from um, mating in November, uh, lambing in March. Um, remembering that these are the cull ewes, so anything that isn't marked by the ram can be culled immediately, that it's weaned from the first set of lambs. So you're only carrying maybe 9-10% uh, of your ewes through the summer um, to, to autumn, so obviously it's not a, a summer dry option, it's a summer safe option, um, and that 55% lambing translates into around about 10% uh, extra lambs um, each year, and they're lambs that you're uh, that born in autumn and available for sale very early in spring when the prices hopefully are quite high, but I'm not going to get into the business of predicting prices, So, but generally speaking prices, premiums exist early in the season. So. We've still got to work some more, make sure that we've got the numbers right, but we see some potential for that. And the work that you're doing with nitrates? Um, this is also associated with uh, uh, parasites. There is some evidence that um, urea, for example, if you soak parasite larvae in urea, they don't like it. They basically die. So we want to check to see whether a... a um, a um, dressing of urea, liquid urea, uh, after um, weaning will get rid of whatever parasites are around in the pastures at that time. So it's, it, it's a bit of an exploratory trial just to see if that's another uh, option we've got in terms of parasite management. Tony, everybody's predicting another long, hot, dry summer like last year. Yeah, here we go again. Um, well. I'm not into predicting either weather or prices, Rob, <laughs> but, but if we do, I mean, I, the story that we've been um, basically talking about in the last year is, is um, flexibility in order to have resilience in, in these kinds of circumstances. And our um, basic notion is that you stock to better than average conditions, so a high stocking rate, but you do it with flexible stock so that you can retreat from that if and when it gets dry, okay? And you need to know that it's getting dry. That might sound silly, but, but um, people need to react quickly, not well after it's all dried up, okay? So you've got to be tracking soil moisture, for example, uh, to see where you are. Now, I understand a lot of farmers are in a, a, 
a more difficult position right at the moment than they were maybe this time last year because we had a very dry uh, summer last year as well. So whether farmers can really uh, put into place what we're, we're talking about now is, is an open question. Two years in a row, if we do get a really dry summer, is an extraordinary uh, kind of situation. It, it's not your one in 10, it's your sort of one in 25 kind of event. And um, you really need contingencies for that. So um, depending on where you are in terms of stocking rate, I think uh, it's a pretty slow spring at the moment. I mean, we've, it's been cold, it's very wet. We're not getting the grass growth, but, but if we do get some growth, then I think, you know, making sure that you've got a stock of, of feed uh, in case we get into trouble, uh, try and retain as much flexibility as you can in terms of the stock that you've got so that if it does get dry, you can uh, unload. The problem is if it doesn't and you've very low stocking rate, the pasture will turn to very low quality and you won't get the performance anyway. So that's the, the trade-off that you've got to make. Difficult circumstance, I would stock as high as I feel comfortable to do it, uh, make sure I've got as much flexibility as I can and I'd make sure the barn's full. And we've got more for you straight after the break. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted southern oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature, good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things. Make a positive change to the planet. To feed the world. To protect the future. To live well to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. To, without gloating, you've been another South Island Championship winning award. Yes, very lucky. I uh, went down last week to Southland Boys High School in Invercargill and awarded their champion Teaneg uh, team the uh, National Grand Champions of Teaneg. So that's the three for the South Island, he says. Yes, sort of, oh, oh, oh. yes no, South Island <laughs> absolutely cleaned up this year. Um, and what was really nice, we divide the South Island into three regions and there was one for each region. So Excellent. More serious subject though, technology, and that's one of your areas that you're very strong on. Yeah, so it's sort of one of those sort of pillars that we want to base our sort of going forward strategy around and that's how we connect to the te technology sector. So as we know with, with nutrient management, with water management, with everything that's going on these days, technology is going to play a much bigger part on how we run our farms, etc. So the big thing that we're trying to do is reach out to industry saying that, look, you know, if you've got innovation that you want to bring to market, we've got a target audience or target group that can validate or pilot or test new product. Our guys like shiny new toys. Yeah. Um, it's the right demographic in terms of the early adopter. Uh, and that validation process can be sped up a lot more efficiently uh, by, by utilising young farmers. I mean, I have trouble setting up my mice, guy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, it's the age thing, isn't yes, it? Yes, absolutely. Know? And, you know, it's a real benefit for our members to be able to sort of see what's coming up ahead um, and, and actually apply these new technologies to, to industry. So, really, it's a test bed? It, it really is. It, it's as simple as that. If you, if you want something that's... That, you know, warts and all, the feedback you get is, is 100%. So, yeah, it is a test bed. So how does it work? I mean, if I've suddenly come up with this idea that 
because of compliance that I can come up with a computer program. Yeah, well, we're working with a couple of organisations, the main one being uh, an organisation out of Palmerston North called BCC, Bringing Clever Company, or Building Clever Companies. And they're an accelerator program, so they're looking at all the inventors and entrepreneurs out there and trying to sort of bring those into a, into a point where they select, say, six or eight a year and bring in seed investors, um, bring in consultants to help them actually build a business out of it. And then we're part of that program in terms of supporting that and, and actually trying to apply it. So we should get our Mrs. Marketing involved with that because marketing of anything new is very, very important as well. Sure, and, and often with people that are gifted in terms of invention or um, those sorts of innovation um, often lack the skills and actually how do you bring a product to market. Compliance, I mentioned compliance. I mean, that, that is making this world so incredibly technical with the restrictions on irrigation usage. and. Oof. Yeah, but if you look at the, the, the stuff that's coming out of... Um, Various programs, like LICs, um, programs, um, and there's a whole whole raft, uh, Farm IQ, for example, that actually have stuff that farmers can work with, young or old, mm. um, that actually help with actually ca capturing the data of, of what's going on on farm, you know, what sort of water is required or, or nutrient or whatever it might be. Um, there's increasingly less and less excuse to say, I don't know what's, how much I need or how much is going on farm in terms of those compliance issues. Terry, I've got to get out of my head when I say young farmers, farmers. There must be another word that I could use. <laughs> it should be young farming or something, shouldn't it? Yeah, and that is a, an issue for us to, to get around. You know, New Zealand Young Farmers has been around since 1932 and it's a historic institution. Um, but as a name, yes, we're way beyond just hands-on farming. You, know, you think of the whole primary industry being everything from agribusiness, banking, uh, veterinary, uh, forestry, Seafood, Market, marketing, marketing, science, engineering, it covers everything. In fact, if you went to university and picked any degree to do, perhaps with the exception of uh, becoming a doctor, um, there is a, a really good career path, satis satisfying and rewarding career path in primary industry. So yes, we're not just talking about farming anymore. I mean, that's seriously, I've got to get it out of my head <laughs> because it, it's always young farmers, yep. bang. Yep. And that's a huge focus for you. Yeah, so we, we spend a lot of time in schools actually working with both the schools and with, with students about sort of career paths and options. And you talk to most university students who are half to two thirds of the way through their degree, they don't actually know where they're going to be end up working. They know what degree they're doing, yep, but yep. where do they end up? What's their trajectory in terms of career choice? So we're actually helping that by saying, well, look, you know, great, you're doing an engineering degree. That's brilliant. We need we need more engineers in this country. However, if you're into process engineering or um, those sorts of things, you know, you think of all the dairy companies, the, 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 the freezing works, the uh, infrastructure that rural New Zealand needs from roading to, so that milk tankers can go down the road properly. There is engineering jobs in our sector for Africa. But people don't go into engineering thinking, oh, well, I think I'll end up in primary industry. No, and marketing is probably even more important because we've got all this food that we produce, it needs to actually be value add, needs to be branded, needs to be New Zealand Inc. But how do we tell that story to overseas markets? We actually need the gifted marketers to come into primary industry. So that's the story we're telling. I want to change the subject slightly. You're the, you're the head of the Canterbury AMP wine tasting and, and judging. Yeah, and I'm you've very opened fortunate. the doors. Yes. So, yeah, it's been around, this is the 13th year of the um, International Aromatic Wine Competition. I'm very lucky that I've. Uh, been involved right from the start, uh, so wine judging is uh, one of my background things, as you know. Um, so this year we've, you know, aromatic is clearly a wine that smells and tastes of the fruit, so it's, mm. it has aromas that you'd associate with the fruit rather than the wine making influence. So the Rieslings, the Sauvignon Blancs, the Pinot Gris, the Gewurztraminer, those sort of things make sense to people. Consumers are actually demanding a lot more softer style red wines, so less oak influence, less Big tannic, that big tannic reds, tannic, yeah. and there's definitely a place for those, and we love them. Cabernet Sauvignons, absolutely, that blow your head off. But we're actually now opening the doors to, to wines that are less oaky, a bit more fruit driven. Rosé is a really classic example of that um, less complex red wine, and it is red wine rather than white wine. You drink it like white wine, but it's made like a red. So we're opening the doors to say, look, anything that's made in an aromatic style should be judged in this forum. So obviously within their categories. So yes, we're looking for all sorts of aromatic reds, we're looking at rosé, we're looking at aromatic sparkling wines, that's also new for us this year. Um, so you know, sparkling Sauvignon Blanc, sparkling Pinot Gris, 
There are plenty of those out in the marketplace. So yeah, makes it quite more it's a an lot amazing more comprehensive. shop window too, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Canterbury A M P wine contest is pretty sought after. It's 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 very, very prestigious. Yeah, it is prestigious. And, and focusing on the varieties that Canterbury have done well in, in the past, you know, certainly with Riesling Pinot Noir as we're now entering into, they're the things that really showcase the, the region. Terry, thank you very much indeed. And of course you can catch up with Terry's interview on our website, which is on the land.co.nz. I'm Rob Cope Williams. You've either been watching or you have just missed the program, but it will be back at the same time next week. Until then, bye now.